Welcome to another episode of On The Line. I'm Joe Mullings, and in studio today, I've got a dear friend as well as a business associate, David Hockman from Orchestra Biomed, the chairman of Orchestra Biomed. Welcome. Yeah, yeah chairman and CEO. Chairman and CEO. There you go. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's a new title for me. Yeah. Do we fit all that on your card? Um, it's it's tough. You know? <laughs> it's tough. Do we have cards anymore? Or just check out that. Yeah, we, uh, we've had a lot of uh, discussion about cards because we have a lot to say on our cards, so we're, we have a few different cards. I'm excited because we're getting a different perspective today. So David uh, and I have, I don't know, is it almost a 20-year history today? No, well, I'm linked to your 20-year history. Right. You and I have known each other probably about now 12 or 13 years. Yeah, ago. from ATI days. Yep. Accelerated Technologies Incorporated. And David brings a, um, and you, you'll hear this today and see this today, a very, very powerful perspective on what I believe to be um, the much-needed future financing um, opportunities in med tech. Um, and our listeners, you should be really interested in this because as you look at organizations, you certainly want to look at market, product, leadership, and mission as we always push. But gosh, you got to have fuel in the tank. You have to have dry powder no matter what you do. And money has become a major issue on the financing side of med tech. Sure. I, I actually think it's even more important using your analogy of fuel in the tank to know exactly where you want to wind up. And then the stakeholders, you know, in the case of capital investors, can get a return and realize a return. And that's been tough in the med tech space for over a decade now. So we've had to be really creative in terms of how to survive and also how to figure out how to thrive given those challenges. And the IPO market was reasonably good in 2018 in, in relative terms to the previous couple of years in med tech, yes? Uh, I think conditionally, I would say um, if you look at the bias still is towards commercial stage companies. And so I think what we're seeing in the last few years is the companies that have crossed the, the desert, across the chasm um, from uh, through product development and now had to change and evolve to commercial stage companies and, and establish an initial commercial footprint for their products have been able to now cross over to the public markets and access that capital. But still, uh, in stark contrast to what happens in the biopharma or biotech space, very, very rare is it to see a med tech IPO for a development stage product. Um, I'm the chairman of a, another company. We developed a technology uh, called Modus GI for, uh, for endoscopy, for colonoscopy, bowel prep. We think it will be a a uh, huge impact on one of the largest medical procedure markets out there. It was, we took Modus public in 2018 in February. So we're coming up on a year anniversary. Uh, I think the statistics are that it was the second IPO for a med tech company going back to 2011 that was pre-commercial. Second IPO in eight years for pre-commercial. If you contrast that to what happens in biotech, and I'm trying to get a specific number, but it is hundreds of IPOs have happened since 2011 pre in the biotech pre-commercial. Um, and that's the standard. So there is still a huge difference between developing a medical device and how do you get that fuel in the tank, as you talk about, to bring it to market, bring it to patients, um, and realize value for your shareholders if it's a med device versus if it's a biotech, a new drug um, technology. And so uh, that's, a, that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about and, and how do we you know, learn from what our colleagues in the biopharma space are doing and what that ecosystem that's been formed around biopharma innovation and trying to see if some of those uh, ideas and principles and pathways, um, some of the things that really fuel and foster innovation in the biopharma world can be applied um, to med device to help us deal with some of the real challenges that we're facing as innovators. Frame out for me from a basic perspective and then we can take a deep dive in a couple sure. of the areas. <clears throat> where you came up with this concept and your team did and are you emulating another market and just give me the basics as understanding some of the listeners may not have financial chops required and we'll start there and can go deeper sure well maybe i'll, I'll, I'll just review you you're familiar with it but just review my background a little bit and where i'm coming from um so i've been involved in in healthcare venture capital now for over 20 years um and the first phase of my career i i worked in some in the device area, but also in biopharma as well as some healthcare services, health, healthcare information. So I've had uh, exposure to a lot of different types of technology. And um, I, I focused on the medtech space, I made the decision to focus in the medtech space in around 2006. Um, 
in hindsight, my timing may not have been so excellent, but the the impetus in my you know what why I wanted to do it I think was you know very personal. I realized as a investor that I also had a, a real entrepreneurial spirit that I liked being involved in the the conceptualization creation of new technology. Even though I'm not an engineer, I'm not a physician, but I felt I could add value to that as as a strategist, as a you know financier. And I had some opportunity to start a company in the interventional cardiology space. And through some connections there, that led me to um, connect with some old friends of yours at Accelerated Technologies, Inc., which had been founded by uh, Marty Leon, who's a very prominent and uh, highly accomplished uh, interventional card cardiologist, really world famous, started TCT and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, who had teamed up with uh, venture capitalist Yuval Benor and, and uh, entrepreneur, device uh, executive Rick Jeffrion, who, who's a really close friend of yours. Um, and they had created ATI. A number of other um, very prominent physicians had been involved in that. Weren't BAME involved in that? Don BAME, Dan Burkoff, uh, I think early you know, stages, uh, Peter Fitzgerald was involved, Eberhard Grube. Um, that group evolved as well. But, you know, the idea was to, um, their idea was very much near and dear to my heart, was to go to a group of key opinion leading physicians who had been actively involved in innovation and clinical development for new technology and, and encourage them to you know have enough time and, and sort of freedom in a, in a in a forum to talk about unmet needs that they saw with patients and talk about them that talk about them in the context of new technology um, what's happening in clinical research what's happening in the startup world what's happening amongst the strategics and use that kind of as our targeting you know what what problems did we see that really appeared as rich um, opportunities for new innovation and use that lens to look at well, what's out there, what are other people doing, what may be available to be shaped, or even more ideally, what could we start ourselves, what could we create ourselves, and, and to build companies around that. And so they'd been at that for about five years when I joined and had um, some really exciting early success. The whole idea was born out of PVT um, which uh, Marty and Yuval were involved in, and that's kind of where they were inspired by, and obviously that's gone on to be one of the most impactful, uh, you know, trans transcatheter aortic valve replacements. Which been, Edwards, Edwards bought um, in 2004, and and you know, and Stan Road drove that with Stan Rabinowitz. I mean, these are incredible innovators that have made a huge impact. Um, another big success out of the early ATI portfolio was Impella, which uh, you know had. In this case, the team didn't start the technology, but, but really found it in a troubled spot and pointed it in, in the right direction. And Impella was, was picked up by, by uh, Abby Med, Mike Minogue. Right. Um, after a few years of being fostered by ATI and pointed in the direction of acute, um, acute cardiovascular support in a you know, hospital for you mm -hmm. know, patients going through high-risk PCI and now a number of other indications. And it's been incredible execution. But the value impact's even you know, more um, extraordinary in the case of, uh, of of Impella. I think you know, I joined. So we wanted to create our own fund. Um, so my job was really to raise a fund to drive this model through another portfolio. Um, so it was interesting. We started raising the fund in 2007. We were still in the market in 2008, and we we were able to raise a small fund. But it was a really challenging period of time to really see almost a total 180 degree reversal of the momentum in the med tech space and certainly in the cardiovascular device space. Um, and we, we said, we, we kept doing what we were set out to do and, and ultimately created uh, four new cardiovascular related products um, and built small, really virtual companies around them largely and also had expanded into the GI and robotic minimally invasive surgery area with some new products. But as, as that 2008-2009 that period unfolded, really big change happened in, in the space that affected certainly our business strategy, our strategy to advance our products and make money. And I, I, think, has, I, I think you would agree and others would agree affected the whole industry. Mm -hmm. and, and there were a few contributing factors. Um, obviously, 2008, we had you know, financial reversal. Um, and so a big shakeout in the capital markets. But I think even more relevant, we had Obamacare. And what Obamacare did, and, and we won't spend this, this time together talking about that, but no. I think one of the things it did for the device space, there was an R&D tax, which I think certainly had an impact on how bigger companies thought about mm -hmm. um, spending money on R&D. 
But there was a major change to how hospitals organized and bought products. And so today, if you talk to anyone in med tech commercialization, one of the things foremost on their mind are value assessment committees or value assessment processes that now every hospital, hospital system has in place. You can have a product through you know, clinical trials, FDA approval, new reimbursement or approved reimbursement, and still the hospitals need to evaluate and decide do they want to buy it and you know, negotiate with you on price. And so that, uh, and it makes sense from them, and that was, I think, we, we want to be rational about it. It's like the healthcare. Walmart model. I mean, um, really, it's almost like the Walmart model is what I look at. You've got to sit in that room, and you've got to defend it, and they're going to beat you down for that extra one-tenth of a cent. And if you've looked at hospital margins, okay, whether they're for-profit or non-profit <laughs> hospitals, can you blame them? Um, but w- what we're still talking about is what's the impact uh, on bringing new therapies forward that can improve clinical outcomes, that can lower cost, that can remove uh, you know, safety concerns and complexities. And so that had a big impact. And, and so the financial markets combined with a you know, change in the landscape for commercialization of therapies in the med tech space uh, spurred a big movement towards consolidation in, amongst med tech companies. And, uh, you know, I, I used to have these statistics off the top of my head, but if you look at M&A activity, you know, going back to around 2011 in med tech, you know, the vast majority of deals, the dollars, the transactions are big deals. You know, multi-billion dollar mm-hmm. deals is a great um, chart I got um, from one of the investment banks, which is a knockout chart. So they showed all of the large cap med tech companies that were around in 2011, and then you see you know, the ones that no longer are there because mm-hmm. they got knocked out, Covidian and mm-hmm. St. Jude Medical and, uh, uh, you know, now more recently companies like uh, Bard or, or Spectronetics. And these are all companies that as an innovator, we were looking to talk to a broader universe of potential acquirers and suddenly that you fell know, off the, the map. The names changed. So, and, and then I think all of that amounted to um, also big changes in how, the whole industry, how the capital markets perceived uh, value of innovation in our space. And, and we should talk more about that. Um, but meanwhile, we were building these products in, in our newest portfolio. We changed the, the firm's name to Orchestra along the way. I, I, uh, I always liked the idea of, and I described in our team, we need all these experts working mm-hmm. together in tandem. I thought that was a great analogy for it. Um, so it was orchestra medical ventures, but we really still were operating, and we didn't realize until somewhere years into our building this new portfolio that the that the rug had been pulled out from under us. We were building products to sell them, you know, like PVT or Impella at a relatively early stage, in a capital efficient manner to bigger companies, and then suddenly we found out that those bigger companies really weren't buying anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and there's exceptions to every rule, but for the most part. They were waiting and, and looking for things that were going to be accretive because they were being measured by a very rigorous standard of growth. Um, you know, the world, the Wall Street world is driven not on no, it's quarter year by to quarter year. It's quarter number. by quarter. It's, yeah. it's, it's hedge and funds. They're, and they're Don't only forget, buying hedge revenue. funds are, are measured month to month. Yeah, and they're, and they're only buying revenue these days. Um, for the most part, yes. Um, and if you look at anything that is an exception, you'll generally find that there is going to be immediate impact on revenue-driven products. You might buy a development stage product, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. You might buy the product even though it's years away from market, Mm -hmm. but you're buying it because your customers that are buying your TAVR products or other structural cardiology products expect you to be talking about these next big things and need to have a solution. But that's interesting. That brings us back to, because I do want to jump speed to go on to um, what your platform is. It comes back to the migration of medtech right now, sliding into a platform mentality versus a product mentality. So take me to Orchestra Biomed. Let's, sure. let's fast forward and talk about that structure. And for our listeners, what is it fundamentally on your thesis mm-hmm. and you're working through right now? And where did you get that from? Yeah, I mean, so it really is an extension of those challenges I was talking about. Yeah. You know, we uh, woke up, uh, we didn't wake up. We've been dealing with for the last several years having uh, Technologies we had developed and brought through to relatively late stages of development that we we are incredibly excited about. 
Um, I'll talk more about that, but we have developed a you know, highly differentiated first-in-class sirolimus eluding balloon that we think can impact the interventional cardiology or coronary and peripheral intervention space in a very significant way. Uh, Ten years of work went into it. We've developed a therapy we call backbeat cardiac neuromodulation therapy, which uh, is focused on high blood pressure. Um, and we think can have a huge impact in the cardiac rhythm management space. And these are big disease states. You're talking about artery disease. You're talking about hypertension. These are the number one and two. So you're going to bring them to market yourself? No. And so we were we had these products, and you know, as I said, we had a model built on relatively early M and A, which wasn't happening. And we're really challenged to think about what to do. Um, there was because of this cascade, early M and A is not happening. IPOs aren't really happening if you're not commercial stage. Uh, there's a limit, therefore, if you think about the, the ecosystem, it's not it's realization. So you, it's your exits. If you can't sell it and you can't take it public, then that affects the whole cascade of capital available along the stages of development. So as we got our ideas to the point where the next stage of development were bigger PMA trials, you know, we really were struggling. Where are we going to get this capital? And we were finding when we talked to investors, while they recognized and were certainly excited about our products and what they could have in terms of impact in the market, their key questions weren't, you know, what's the risk of the clinical trial? What's the risk of regulatory approval, even necessarily reimbursement? All those are relevant questions. But it's how are you going to commercialize this product? Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to, are you going to build another interventional cardiology Salesforce? Sure. Are you going to build a whole other CRM platform? Sure. And we realized these were pretty stupid questions for a startup company to that is we had built all of our expertise around developing it to have to answer. And so we started looking at what can we learn from, in particular, our bar farm or peers, as I said earlier, and how can we rethink our business model to take, unlock the value of our products and to try and thrive in a very difficult environment. So over the last couple of years, we have kind of transformed our, our incubator venture capital portfolio approach now into an operating business. And uh, we just did this in 2018, um, both in terms of the organizational structure and raising some additional capital. And we're really excited about a new business that we formed from that called Orchestra Biomed. And we see ourselves very much in the mold of an innovation company. That's what we do well. Um, an innovation company that, as we say, is applying a we believe proven biopharma business model, but to more predictable, um, we think uh, lower risk med tech assets. And our goal is very simple. Look, what do investors want uh, from a company? They want that company to produce cash flow opportunities. So we really are thinking much less about a transactional business because we realize we play a very important role and should play a very important role in continuing to advance our products and more about how do we participate long-term in those products maturing through partnerships. Okay, if you, so that's you're, no really longer, the idea. You're, no looking for, you're no longer looking for the pop on the exit. No. You're looking for a shared risk-reward. Exactly. On bringing in, in this case, a commercial partner mm -hmm. who may be lacking innovation on the early end or maybe has their own innovation, but this complements their platform. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to do a revenue share downstream. Exactly. And that sounds very novel when you're talking about medical devices. That is standard practice when you're talking about drug development. How does that fit into the classic venture capital fund of a 10-year life on that fund for, and for the investors who put their money in? What has to be rejiggered there? Well, so as I said, we've transitioned our business. And so uh, we are now running an operating business. Our funds are shareholders in the operating business. But we have a clear intention, which is also more common in the biopharma space, to build a business that eventually can go public, access the public capital markets, and grow through uh, developing a, a, a rich pipeline over time and building shareholder value and liquidity in the public market. So this is a pathway for an IPO? It is uh, certainly intended to become a public company at some point in the future, yeah. And the driving force behind this is an innovation engine, product mm -hmm. development, getting a number of partner suitors who have existing platforms? Because it sounds like it should be set up for somebody who has an existing platform. Well, the simplest piece is we were able to build and jumpstart our conceptual business model with assets that were mature that we had developed ourselves, that we felt were perfect 
examples of or perfect uh, uh, platforms around which to build a partnership or, or, or if you're going to try and create a, a med tech company doing biopharma business, these were perfect assets. And so we should talk about the assets, but um, we really recognized uh, that we had products that had big potential impact that made much more sense to pursue through partnership than through building out and trying to eventually get to an M&A exit. Give me a hypothetical on that. So, and again, you can't go into detail on it, but from what I understand is you've got an opportunity that's in the mix right now mm -hmm. for the drug eluting balloon or the drug coated balloon, the Sorolimus. Well, uh, what do, maybe what you're asking is, what do we mean by a partnership? Yeah, okay. yeah, play out who is the partner, partner A coming in, and how does that relationship, really bring it down for me, how does that relationship work? I'm an engineer listening to this. Yep. And I'm sitting there deciding, I'm gonna get an offer from um, Caliber. And this is a new model for me on the financing side. Well, it's a new model for you, but but if you have any friends or you you know, you've been involved in the biotech industry, it's an old model. So let's talk about that and, and I'll put then I'll try and come back. The the standard approach for how to commercialize drugs, and when I say standard, the one that's most common. Mm -hmm. It's not the only one, but it's the most common is to do through to do that through risk reward sharing arrangements with uh, with bigger biotech, bigger pharma companies that have established distribution. They have big sales force, they have big marketing organizations. They are calling on the physicians that are gonna prescribe those drugs every day. And, and, and that's their bread and butter. That's what they're best at. And they, they you know, not to say that these companies aren't good at clinical you know, trial execution or regulatory affairs, but they are best at selling drugs. In relative terms to discovery. Exactly. Um, and, and some of that, we can, and this is, I think, an important thing we should come back to, but it's the culture. You know, what, what culture do you have and what, and what kind of competencies, what kind of personalities you need to drive innovation when there's risk mm -hmm. of total failure um, versus what kind of culture and what kind of competencies you have to have when you have proven products that now need to be you know, positioned in the marketplace and maybe out positioned against competitive products. They're different businesses. So you know, if you look at big pharma or now you know, big mature biotech companies, the Genentechs, the Amgen. What's the damn biotech? You know, farmers, farmers struggling. What's the damn biotech? Well, but, you know, but some, it, it, pharma, there's a blurring of lines yeah. between mature commercial organizations in, that sell drugs. All right, let's just let's look at it that way. They, are, they have all, this whole industry has adopted over the last several decades um, and advanced complex structures that basically are based on risk reward sharing. We want, and what is it basically saying? A company with a commercial organization wants to basically fill their pipeline with drugs that have significant commercial potential and to have all those shots on goal mm -hmm. and opportunities for commercialization. And they want to share the burden of development with, the, with innovative companies that they think can go, do a good job of doing that. Innovators, you know, so you know, biopharma innovators need capital. It's very expensive to develop drugs. Um, it's a lot of risk. And so they've figured out structures where, you know, the small company says, I'll give you the exclusive rights to commercialize, whether that's globally or regionally, in exchange for dollars um, up front and through milestones to help me develop the drug and you know, rewards and additional dollars based on success. And then importantly, royalty or revenue sharing arrangements. And those arrangements in the biopharma world have gotten more and more sophisticated. Uh, royalties, synthetic royalties, revenue sharing, co-promotion. There's a lot of different structures that people have used um, now to advance this. What does it really do? It fuels innovation. That is key to unlocking capital and unlocking value. You know, if you're joining a biopharma company that may be in preclinical or early phases of the clinical development, those companies can be publicly traded companies with hundreds of millions or even in some cases billion dollar market caps that can be huge wealth generators for their teams even though they haven't yet proven the drug. Let me give you a scenario. Yeah. So we're hearing all this, and device specifically. Yeah. We're hearing um, about the wonderful step in of Apple, mm, Google, uh, Samsung, Microsoft, looking for partners in medtech. And, and reflexively, everybody looks at, okay, they're gonna partner with J&J, &J, or they're gonna partner with Medtronic, right? Because if you think about it, those organizations, while they're innovation houses, they also have a fantastic downstream distribution and tech mindset of selling product. So stay with me. Yep. 
in your model, <clears throat> it makes sense that your potential acquirers of some of your tech could be some of these large infotech data tech companies that then bolt on a CRO organization, bring in innovation partners, or start to select from the ocean of innovation companies like Orchestra. And now what you've got is you've got deep cash, billions of dollars of cash in the bank. So you've got that fuel. Yeah. Now what they don't have though is those organizations, which they have to count on to big med tech, is access to patients and access to physicians. Yeah. You take that out, big med tech loses its interest to big tech because they can sidestep big med tech. So here's an accelerator to that environment. So I'm saying you take an Apple who does not have access to the patient, but they have access to med tech innovation, yeah. the reg clin strategy, you buy a CRO or you partner with the CRO to run your clinical trial, and then you start now to decide to build out a clinical, a, a sales force. And now you are entering the $450 billion a year med tech I mean, company. I think it would be fascinating um, if you see technology companies like Apple or Google. Uh, no, it's when, it's not if. Yeah, well, when, okay. When you see them uh, ultimately making that move to, to acquire the distribution channel. But your model sets that up where it hasn't been present. So I want to come back to closing the loop on the model, but I think that if you look at convergence, convergence of technology, so a lot of our products, our drug and blue, is a convergence of advanced drug delivery, mm -hmm. you know, really expertise from the pharmaceutical space, and um, proven device technology, balloon angioplasty. In our case, we had an innovation around what we call a, a microporous um, balloon angioplasty system. That's a convergence, but there's a lot of convergence happening where you're talking about uh, digital informatics, uh, decision support, um, you know, patient uh, uh, patient support through apps and through you know behavior modification. Um, so we're seeing a lot of convergence of technologies. So traditional devices is going to converge with information technology, converge with bio pharmaceutical technology, and create a rich environment for partnership. And we're excited about that for the future because we're building a biz business which. We want to be around for the long term. You know, we're not looking to transact the whole business. We want to transact or partner products and find those products fostered by you know, partnerships to get to patients. And we think a lot of the partnerships that we can drive in the future are going to be not just one licensing partnership, but creating collaboration. I was very interested by the announcement uh, last week in the formation of Galvani by uh, basically Verily uh, and by Google's healthcare. You know, business and by GSK. And GSK and it's all focused on what they call bioelectronics. But I love the concept. We call our our group developing our backbeat cardiac neuromodulation therapy, we call that our bioelectronic therapies group. Um, because because bioelectronics are one of the biggest new opportunities and you know decades of, of forward-looking innovation will be driven by how we tap the electrophysiological you know system. Um, and, and in the neuro, neurophysiological system to create healthcare outcomes, mm -hmm. really make us potentially better humans. But I'd, I'd go back to that collaboration. You've got you know, one of the biggest technology you know, leaders in the world partnering with one of the biggest pharmaceutical leaders in the world to look at a huge white space ocean of new opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, very interesting, and it's to that point because things that they do together can take the best of both worlds and have that ability to translate things that have to get through physicians to patients through a distribution channel. And then on that point, you bring the last mile back all the time with these companies, meaning, and, and, I, and I talk about this on the iPhone, right? So I believe that the big data tech companies have very little interest in the device itself. They have interest in the data that's being um, facilitated off the device because the data is where you get that nonlinear growth all the time in regards to value. I, I, I like to look at it a step beyond that, yeah. which is what do you do with it? What do you do with the data? How well, does the data you affect? You have to get it first, though. Sure. Okay. Um, and we're living in an era of massive controversy around you know how you get at data. Um, something close and near and dear to my heart. We won't go down that, mm -hmm. that channel, but you should look for a Netflix documentary called The Great Hack coming out. It features one of my dearest friends, Dave Carroll. 
you know, data and data privacy and how data is being, you know, utilized, weaponized is, is going to be the, one of the great issues of our lifetime. Mm-hmm. I, I like to think about it in terms of healthcare around what do we do with that? How do we impact patients? How do we make, you know, physicians better? And that's a big opportunity and somewhere we're spending time on as we look ahead. Um, if I can bring it back to the orchestra biomed business model. So we really studied, so going back to your example, we looked at how our peers do it in biopharma, these risk reward sharing collaborations and how does that impact the ecosystem that they have to cap to capital has an impact how they construct, you know, how innovators construct and how, you know, venture capitalists construct startup companies. And we said it's starkly different um, from what has taken, taken root in the med tech space. Med tech space today is basically build, sell or die. Okay. You build something, you know, you, you build it to commercial, maybe you get it public. Uh, maybe you can get something to a point where it can be sold to a strategic if you can't do that and you can't get the capital to do that, you're dead. All right. That's really frustrating. We were facing those kind of considerations and largely because it had, there's no forward valuing that whole idea. You know, really, if you look at how analysts at the same firms cover a biotech company versus a med tech company, and you try and reverse the models, you will see med tech companies that should be worth a lot more than they are and biotech companies that are worthless. If you don't put ascribe future value to an innovative technology that's not yet commercial, it's worthless. How do you value it? It becomes, you know, whatever the investor who may be interested wants to pay for it. So that lack of forward value is a huge problem. And so all these companies are single product companies that, you know, they have to eventually translate to commercial. Those are real challenges. So what we've done in Orchestra Biomed is assemble a portfolio of products that we think are optimized for risk reward sharing partnerships. And because we have a portfolio of them, and, and, and actually they're really platform technologies with lead indications. For example, the Virtue Balloon were focused initially on some core indications in the coronary as well as peripheral space. We expect to start a pivotal trial in the U.S. in coronary instant restenosis, which is a real and growing problem. Um, a lot of data coming out, and that's about 11% of uh, total PCI procedures. Now we have 20 plus years of drug of dr- stents and drug eluting stents. There is a perpetual event rate of failure of stents that need to be treated. Um, so that's a lead indication, but we think the technology will apply to small vessel disease, peripheral indications like below the knee. So we have a whole stream of indications, but that's just the interventional cardiology application of the drug technology we developed, delayed release serolimus. So what we can do now is go back to your example is form a partnership um, with a company And there's multiple options that have established presence globally or strong regional presence in interventional cardiology in these cath labs that are looking for a new product and say, hey, let's partner on this. Let's share the risk and reward. What do we expect out of it? We expect the same things that our biopharma peers would get for licensing a major potential innovation to a partner in a risk reward sharing arrangement. If we look at those indications, that product could mature to a billion dollar plus revenue product. So we're looking at an arrangement where there are upfront payments that help us fund the development, milestone progress payments, success payments, and then most importantly, because we're really focused on long-term cash flow, uh, a revenue sharing arrangement that is a win-win arrangement. Um, Over the long term, we expect if the product is as impactful as we believe it will be, the returns to Orchestra Biomed and to our shareholders will be much more substantial than if we sold the technology today. But we are taking the risk and also taking on the responsibility to work with our partner over a long period of time. Um, Go back to the examples we talked about earlier. If the PVT or Impella transactions had been structured with revenue sharing arrangements and that type of structure, the windfall to the ATI investors would be much more substantial. Uh, I looked at that very closely. But that's not what was being done at the time, and so there's no fault in that. Um, So... We, that's what we're doing. We have uh, our core technologies we think are perfect fits for that. Why? Uh, that balloon address, that, that therapy addresses a large, mature global market. Um, the mature piece is the most important. You know, uh, PCI is not a rapidly growing market anymore. There are pockets in you know, places like China and India where procedure rates are growing rapidly, but you know, they're a single digit growth market. Um, so really the market's mature. Now it's a question of a new technology that's disruptive can affect share in a big way mm-hmm. and maybe grow sub segments where, you know, the patient, where the current solutions aren't optimal. 
you know, for, for example, today in instant restenosis, we're putting more stents on stents. That's not a great solution. It's actually off label. Uh, below the knee disease, which actually directly leads to amputation, really is related to critical limb, limb ischemia with these below the knee lesions. Uh, really, we don't have a great um, you know, solution for, for, for those patients. So you can disrupt an established market. Our other therapy, the backbeat device, is built off of really the, the same hardware and procedure as a pacemaker. Pacemaker is another, you know, think about pacemakers going back 20, 20 years. That was exciting new technology. It led to, you know, new fields in cardiac rhythm management, like cardiac resynchronization therapy or implantable cardiac defibrillators. You know, all this stuff, none of these are big growth markets anymore, and they've matured and flattened out. You know, once again, China, India, places where they're growing, but the price points aren't necessarily mm -hmm. getting better. We introduce into that market a new algorithmic-based therapy that's going to treat an entirely new indication, high blood pressure, and we think can be used for other indications, heart failure and beyond. Um, what can it do to that market in a mature market? It can drive growth. It can, in the hands of one or two licensing partners, drive differentiation, shift in market share. We think we can open up applications for the technology to new patients, patients with high-risk uh, hypertension indications. So what we we have is a great set of products affecting big markets where the dynamic of partnership actually we think fits the product better than the traditional you know approach if we had to go build a sales force and build these businesses out they may never see the light of day and that you know is what's most exciting we've changed the business model in a way that we actually think we have unlocked huge potential we believe that this business model risk reward sharing partnering licensing there are other opportunities in the device space to apply that type of structure. And when you begin to think about it as a continuum from conceptualization of a new therapy all the way through you know, patient access and realization, um, if we begin to see an interesting, you know, if you look at some of the companies that have done you know, risk reward or structured deals in the space, St. Jude was a, was a big um, uh, structured deal maker. Um, Eric Fain, who was their president, um, is on our board, and we've been learning a lot from Eric, and he's he's been really excited. If we look at some of the things Boston have been doing, mm -hmm. been structured, but l not really licensing deals. You know, but if you think of long-term risk reward sharing and applying that to medtech, we think it's a big idea. We think it's going to be good for all of the players in the field. If you look at the big companies, they need to figure out fundamentally they're not good at doing innovation. They're not good at doing R and D. So they need to figure out how to fill their pipelines and plan their pipelines without having to get punished for spending money on non-accretive M&A. That's really the issue. Um, risk reward sharing is a much better way for them to do it. Their biopharma peers do it all the time. Um, and frankly, it also might be a good way for them to try and unlock value in R&D projects that are stuck in the wrong culture internally in a big company. Um, you know, certainly the investors in the space will benefit from having more optionality, from having other pathways to build value, whether that's in the public markets, in the private markets, in venture capital, and certainly, and certainly we think, um, and, and as, you know, as people who are passionate about innovation, that's really what we live and breathe, we think this is really important because, you know, it's hard to get up every day and go to work on developing a new technology if you don't have confidence and belief that that technology is going to get fostered and found its way to the patient. You know, for me, that's really was the decision to pursue healthcare as a non-healthcare background person. Why did I choose early in my venture career to say I want to do this? Because you know, suddenly I realized I could, with my skill set, paired with you know, the right um, you know, technology and clinical experts, I could suddenly have a big impact over my lifetime on people uh, when, you know, my mother, unfortunately, is in the hospital now, she's, she's going to end up having uh, a valve surgery in a few weeks. You know, the idea that I could participate in developing technology that could, you know, have an impact on my family or on other people's family when the world, you know, sort of, when someone's sick and you have that kind of issue, the world shrinks down to what are we going to do about this loved one in this situation? That becomes the focal point of everyone. And so the idea that we've been working and struggling to develop these new therapies and, yes, realize value from them in a weak ecosystem that isn't really accelerating or fostering innovation has been incredibly frustrating. And we are energized and excited about you know, really taking proven strategies 
from our peers in biopharma, trying to apply them selectively to the technology that we know, which frankly is actually more predictable, you know, at lower risk, and use that to accelerate them to patients is incredibly exciting for us. And we think we uh, have a great portfolio, the right products, and, and frankly, our goal is to you know, leverage the model and, and hopefully the success we have in applying the model to expand what we do to other areas and, and also see other people learn from what we're doing and, and see it re-energize our space a little bit. Cool. I know that uh, 2019 is a big year for you coming up and you get down here because one of your properties is down here and you also have family down here. Will you come down and share how this journey is going and yeah. release some big headlines coming up I soon? think we have uh, some potentially big headlines coming up. We're okay. optimistic and uh, certainly uh, always love talking to you. Awesome. Well, this has been another episode of On the Line. I'm Joe Mullings with David Hockman in studio. I hope you enjoyed. See you soon.